Good evening. Welcome to tonight's presentation of the User Experience Speaker Series. My name is Chen Zhou. I'm a professor and the chair of the Department of Technical Communication and Interaction Design at Metropolitan State University in the Twin Cities. This speaker series creates a platform for industry leaders to share their insights. Tonight's topic is creating diversity and inclusion in UX research and design. Our society is experiencing growing diversity. As user experience professionals, a key question that we must reckon with is how we transform that diversity into concrete solutions. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lisan Norman. Dr. Norman has had a distinguished career in human-centered design at Dell, Visa, and now at Gusto in Austin, Texas. She brings a strong mix of methodology and social justice with a PhD in African and African-American studies and social anthropology from Harvard. She's also the founder of Black UX Austin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Norman. Thank you so much, Dr. Jai. I really appreciate you inviting me to come to speak to the students. Um, I wanted to sort of start out a little bit tonight, just sort of first introducing myself to you all, letting you all know who I am. Um, and then we'll dive into, um, you know, really talking about how do we create um, diversity and inclusion in UX research and design, right? So who am I, right? Like who is, who is Dr. Norman? Um, I always tell people, first of all, I'm, I'm a traveler. Uh, I've been traveling all my life. So I started out here in Jamaica. That's where I was born. Um, and at the age of three, uh, my parents moved to New York, right? So the Big Apple. Um, I was super fortunate to grow up there. Uh, while in high school, I got a chance to study abroad as a senior in Barcelona, Spain. Um, and learn to improve my Spanish. Um, and then when I went to college, I also studied abroad in Rio de Janeiro and took that opportunity to uh, learn Portuguese and just to expand myself, get familiar with Latin America. Um, one of the greatest trips that I ever did uh, to this day, I'm hoping there'll be more, but I followed uh, sort of, I love history um, and I am fascinated with ruins. So I actually started in Peru at Machu Picchu um, and then traveled north uh, through Colombia and then into Central America where I followed the Mayan trail um, from Honduras through Belize up into Mexico. Um, and so these are some of the highlights of that like Copan in Honduras um, and Bonon Park in, in Mexico. That was one of the, the greatest trips that um, so far I've ever taken in my life. Um, but as I mentioned, I was born in Jamaica and I'm that has had so much influence on who and what I am. Uh, the part of Jamaica that I'm from is actually the home of jerk. So when you all hear about jerk chicken and jerk pork, the part of Jamaica that I'm from, Boston, like Port Antonio, that's where jerk originated. Um, also too, I'm very proud, you know, Bob Marley and reggae music that's been sort of taken around the world and has this sort of international scope. And um, my parents just raised us to be really proud of who we were um, and our heritage. Um, the other part of, that I tell people is I'm a New Yorker. Like I'm a very hardcore <laughs> New Yorker growing up in Brooklyn, New York, uh, also very much shaped who and what I am and coming to the States. My parents were um, very, adamant that we would understand American history. So they would take us to all these, like the, the White House, you know, the Liberty Bell, like anywhere on the, the East Coast that they could get in a car and drive us to, we, we saw and spent a lot of time there. Um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s in New York, which was a very different time. Uh, it was a time of, with Keith Haring, there was, you know, lots of graffiti on the trains and New York was, you know, 
it was, a, it was a lot grittier than it is now, right? Like CBGB was like a place with a lot of punk bands that we would, you know, as young kids kind of get to actually sneak into and see some really great bands. But that being in that city and having sort of the exposure to so much culture and so many um, different uh, cultural influences really also to made a, a big difference in, in who I am and, and as a person, right? And the diversity of New York, right? Like I, in this picture, like I put like my favorite things, right? Like we would go to Chinatown for dumplings. And then like, there was a San Gennaro festival on Little Italy, um, the Puerto Rican day parade, and then the West Indian day parade on Labor Day. So again, all of this sort of like having access to that kind of influence um, made me even just being in New York feel more a part of an international community. Um, I went to boarding school in uh, Northwestern Connecticut for four years, which was super pivotal in, in me learning just and being exposed actually now to a more international community. Um, one of the things that I mentioned is I did study abroad uh, in Spain when I was a senior and this was life-changing for me, right? To, to sort of be exposed to a different way of thinking, a different way of being in the world um, and learning this language and new perspective on life sort of started this lifelong love of wanting to learn other languages um, and to really understand others. And I think also had a lot to do with me eventually be choosing to study um, anthropology to learn more about how do people make meanings in their life and culture and how do you create that. Um, <clears throat> I went to Brown for undergrad um, and did my work in uh, development studies where that's how I ended up studying in Brazil and sort of really focused on sort of the political social development of third world countries, particularly focused on Brazil and West Africa. Those were my two main focuses. After that, I went to Ohio State University where I got a master's in African studies. Uh, there and sort of started actually studying African languages. I studied Zulu as well as Kiswahili. Uh, at the time, I was thought I would do my research uh, in South Africa, and but life pivots and changes. I ended up actually moving back to New York for a little bit uh, and working in corporate America. Right, I worked for Lehman, I worked for Deloitte, I worked for Pfizer, um, mostly in their sort of international human relations department because at the time. You know, I spoke Portuguese, Spanish, and French quite fluently, and so I was able to sort of work in those spaces and meet a lot of different people and, and, and do really interesting work. Uh, but I, I felt something was was missing. You know, I really sort of wanted to um, to get back to, to studying uh, Black history in general, and so I applied and went to Harvard to do a PhD in African African American studies and social anthropology doing this dual degree. And it was really sort of a lot of the, the training that I had that sort of ended up influencing where, how I ended up like going into to UX research. And I'll get into that in a bit. Um, I graduated from Harvard in 2015 um, and thought that, you know, I would go on to teach. But when I moved to Austin, Texas, uh, I actually sort of um, got really enamored by user experience uh, and, and didn't realize that at the time, like, Austin was becoming a tech hub. And I was meeting a lot of people who were talking about this. And I was like, oh, is these are experience. They're like, well, you know, you have this anthropology background and you have the skills and the ability, right, to, to you know, think critically, to be able to talk to people and sort of pull out what, what are their motivations? Like, what is what are what are some of the patterns that we're seeing in like in their behavior that sort of help us to then think about how do we design an experience that is human-centered and that meets the needs of individuals. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into that. But I, my fun fact, I always like to tell people this, I love Rafael Nadal. I, <laughs> any chance I get to see him, luckily, every single time I've went to the US Open, I've gotten a chance to see him play. It is my dream to travel to Australia one day to see him play in the Australian Open. Um, but that's a little side just fun fact. What I want us to like jump in and really sort of talk about is something that I've become really passionate about uh, in, my, in my career and in my time working in, um, in the tech field and user experience is this idea of diverse, diverse and inclusive design, right? And it's again, it's like based on a simple principle that designing for the widest range of people creates better designs and it benefits 
everyone. I cannot drive this principle home enough to folks. I'm constantly sort of starting off like all the projects that we do, working um, in UX with this thought, like let's think about who are we designing for and what is the, you know, like what, what are the, who, who might potentially use this and who might potentially be harmed by this as well, right? Because as I've come to see um, in, in the world, is that there's just this bad design. There's a lot of design that hasn't taken into account the diversity of our population, right? So as you all can see, this is a scanner at an airport, right? We all go through this, right, you know, all the time. This is a picture of me and this is the hair. I have a lot of hair. What I have learned over the years is that these two things don't mix well. <laughs> um, I have literally, every time I go through the scanner, my hair sets it off. And I have, now I've had to, well, now it's better, but I had to start to build in extra time because initially what happened is it went off and they wanted to pat through my hair because they were like, that's what set the machine off. And I was like, this is, this is insane that, you know, whoever was designing this product didn't think about that there would be people with different types of hair that would come through this, right? So it, really, it wasn't tested on anyone <laughs> who had a thickness of hair. And so again, this is where we see an example of, you know, that, you know, not being inclusive and really thinking like who, what is the broader population that this product could serve? Again, like, you know, puts us in this place where now I still have to take extra time. Another example, of, you know, again, the lack of diversity, a lack of thought of, you know, who, who was the wider population that potentially, we all know that a lot of um, companies have been experimenting with self-driving vehicles. Uh, what they found out though, when through testing was that these vehicles were more than likely to, you know, would hit a person with a darker skin tone and had a harder time developing that. And people don't think about, and one of the first thoughts that occurred to me was, you know, like, were there any people of color on the team responsible for feeding images into the computer, right? Like we all remember there's a human element like involved, right? It's AI, but it gets its information from whatever you input into that database and in that system. Um, so again, another example of, you know, where had there been some folks of color even the thought of who would be, you know, who are the possible users for this product and for this, would have thought and would have landed a little bit differently, right? The other question, right? Did the testers even think about testing on subjects of different races, right? Did it even occur to them, right? Another example of design gone wrong. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but this was literally a sweater that Gucci made. I, I want to say like, I think it came out 2019. And I saw this and again, my first question was, what is what? Was there a single Black person in the room? Or do even any of the people in the room even know any Black people to know that the image of this is offensive and the, the connotations, the historical connotations that it implies and the history that has accompanied these kinds of images, you know, how is that even possible, right? So this is where we have to start to think about, right, the kinds of facts and things that how we end up having situations and having bad design like this. Fact, 75% of white people have less than one friend or associate that is a person of color. This was a study done here in the United States and this was the result, right? So this is, again, these are the, the things that we have to think about. These are the elements at play in who's in the room and who's designing and for whom are they designing. Here is a, a chart like showing the lack of diversity that is exists within the UX research and even in UX design professionals, right? As you can see, 56.6% white, 25%, almost 26% Asian, Hispanic and Latino 8.4, Black or African American identifying 5.4, and even more dismally, American Indian or Alaskan Native. 0.2, right? So we see that there is a problem with the, the level of diversity just amongst professionals, right? So it brings us back to this question of, you know, who, who's in the room, right? Who's involved in the creative process? 
Like this is something that is, 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 it's so important. I can't stress enough, right? This is why it is important that, and I love a program like this, that's bringing more folks into this uh, design process and to think about contributing to creating products that a large number of individuals are going to use. One of the things that I always sort of start off with, with the teams that I lead and with the work we're gonna do is I have folks think about like, are you, like we have to confront our bias, right? We have to be ready to admit and confront it, right? Bias is, you know, prejudice in favor or against one thing, person or group compared with another, usually in a way that considered to be unfair. Um, this has to start to become a part of, and it has, we've been incorporating it in the design process that we've been thinking through and reshaping at Gusto is one of the things we start off with is like, you know, let's, let's think about our biases. Like everyone that's at this table now, let's think about that. And, and how do we check that? Um, the biggest thing with the, is the cognitive bias, right? Like that happens. It's, you know, it's very unconscious and un, you know, unintentional. But right, this is a series of shortcuts our mind takes that often help, but it can sometimes hurt, right? And, and I have to say, like my, my level of awareness with, you know, bias and cognitive bias, particularly as it happens in design, I owe much of it to, um, you know, David Dillon Thomas, who wrote this amazing book, Design for a Cognitive Bias, that I really encourage all of you to read. Um, whenever you get a chance, because it really sort of helps to open up our minds and helps you to really think about the different ways. And it allows you to have a very different approach then when you start to think about design. Also been very influenced by um, these wonderful two amazing women at Project In Block, Boyat Gao and Jahan Mantin, who came up with sort of a series and a way for approaching, right? They're doing the work to help us think about how do we change this design process? How do we make it more inclusive? And coming up with a system that a framework is that they call design for diversity. I've also been extremely fortunate to have known amazing um, other UX professionals like Oveta Sampson, who is currently running the design at Capital One right now, um, who sort of told me, you know, I was having a conversation with her and I was like, how do I how do I start to incorporate these different ways of approaching design, you know, at in, in my, you know, design team where I'm at. And she was like one of the first, and she was, and she was like, one of the first things you have to start doing is thinking about the different exercises you can do to get people to be honest about their bias, right? To get people to think about who are they designing for? And then who are they potentially leaving out of that conversation, right? Um, and so I, I owe a lot to, you know, these amazing folks that I've been able to have conversations with that have helped me to really think about um, the design process differently and how to make, create a more diverse, and inclusive design process. So one of the things was, you know, rethinking, because to me, a lot of it for me, and I'm, I'm a little biased, right? I am a UX researcher. Um, and so I think a lot of it starts there with the research process. Right. Um, and, and how do we think about, you know, ensuring that biases don't creep into our product? And one of the things that I've realized is that, you know, we have to have the team, like I mentioned, think about their identities and how does that impact the process? So usually what we start off is like a meeting of the team and we talk through this. Um, what we do is there's uh, there's a bias test that IAT that Harvard, a Harvard professor developed. And what we do is we have everyone on the team take this um, implicit bias test and sort of bring their results and, and, and sort of be honest about it, right? And think about, okay, now that you sort of looked at, you know, the kind of biases, how do you think that's going to influence and impact this product? And again, the question I very much like to think, let's also now think about who do we think could be most harmed by this product, right? Like we have to think about um, those that would be most vulnerable. And I have to say in discussions that I've had uh, with different colleagues and in different spaces, what um, one young designer, he said to me, he was like, you know, the other thing is to think about how do we heal through some of the products that we're designing as well, right? Like how do we, how, let's think about that aspect of it as well. So we're not just focused on sort of the negative, but we, we're, we're balancing it with that positive. So I, will, I always say that as well, think about, okay, yes, 
who may be harming, and then how can we heal through this product as well? I think that's super important. Um, just a different dynamic and a different way to approach the work that we do. Um, one of the things that particularly I like to start with is recruiting in an intentionally diverse way, right? And this is not always easy. I think that, you know, it's, it's, it requires a lot more time and effort for those of you who've, you know, had to spend time doing recruiting folks for your, like your research and your studies for, you know, when you're designing a product, it's not easy, right? And I always tell people I'm very, I, I'm very intentional making sure that we have diversity in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of age, geographic location, right? There's so many different elements that go into that. Um, and one of the things too, to think about is when you, again, when you're engaging with communities who have been exploited or historically have had less decision-making power to be very intentional, to invite them into um, the process, right? In a way that they that is beneficial but acknowledges their agency right and the power that they have um one example of this is uh <clears throat> recently we've been doing research uh at gusto on how to build a credit product right and a credit product that will be most beneficial for low low income hourly wage workers which we know given our information like tend to be black and brown Right. So thinking about and then a lot of them tend to have no credit to be what's called credit invisible or their access to credit is so it's so difficult. Right. High APRs, you know, um, you know, very low, um, you know, uh, credit lines that don't help them to sort of, you know, build credit and to then then build a stable financial background. Uh, and so one of the things that we were thinking of is like, how, how do we make this more of a partnership, right? Like, how do we make this so as we design? So we created um, like a council of, of folks to come in and to have conversation with and to be participants in the design that we do, right? Like giving them some of the tools and being like, you know what, how would you design this? What would work best for you? And what we've realized is that what you empower you empower folks who who've traditionally not been empowered right who traditionally have been sort of ignored um and not made a part of that process and it really it, it to see my colleagues right engage with this it's really changed the way that they're thinking and it's opened up that their minds to other possibilities in other ways because for most of them you know they don't they don't think much about their credit right they have good credit they when they want to they can apply for a credit card you know they don't realize that if you don't have good credit, you can't necessarily um, get an, rent an apartment in the place that, you know, that's most ideal for you. You can't necessarily easily, you know, get a car at a, at a low rate or at a low fee. Like there's just so many elements into that. And it was, it was really interesting to see once we brought them into the process, the way in which it opened up uh, the, the minds of not only, you know, these individuals, but also to my colleagues to sort of think differently and think through this product. Um, I always sort of tell people, you know, you have to be creative in your recruiting approaches, right? Like seeking out different networks. I mean, we've started using things like, like Facebook and, and finding Facebook groups actually, um, in order to like, you know, for people who are like trying to learn about how to build their credit right in this example. Um, and in order to then again, get, get it, get folks that we normally wouldn't get through using a recruiting service. Um, the other thing is we varied our interview schedules, right? Like I started, you know, for folks who work, if you work from seven to five, you can't, it's not easy for you to just take an hour out of your day and just, you know, get on the, you know, the me to, to, to do a Zoom to sort of help me. So, you know, we started doing it, like offering like early morning sessions or late night sessions, right? Like in the evening, right? When it's convenient to you. Um, the other thing is learning to employ scrappy methods. Like honestly, sometimes one time we were doing a project and we just went out in the streets of New York and just started like talking to people, like asking people, will you take two seconds? You know, like we had these little um, pins, I think, or pins we were giving out, like, will you take two seconds to answer a couple of questions for me? Um, because again, it wouldn't be as necessarily as easy to get these folks in the room, but it's important to have their input into and that data to think about when then taking that research and translating that um, into design, right? So this is, again, you have to be thinking about it in a larger sense of 
how do I reach a more diverse population? How do I reach um, a community that traditionally hasn't been uh, a part of these conversations and traditionally people haven't thought about designing for them specifically? Um, one of the things I, I, I like to, to think about and like, you know, what is it that I bring to the table um, that I find in, in design that's really important to me? Um, and one of those things is empathy and diversity. Right. Like, you know, I, I, you know, work with like an atmosphere of empathy and ethics. And I really always try to challenge the companies I work for um, to prioritize these kinds of questions, like asking, you know, like, what is it that we're intending to do here? Right. Like, what is it that we think might be an end result of this? And I definitely and I and I tell you, I learned this right in my anthropological training. Right. I learned to be sensitive to others, right? To think about, you know, their perspective and to listen, right? That's the other thing that I talk about. Like, let's listen to, to folks, right? I also bring my lived experience as a black woman in the UX, right? Like in the US to, to work, like that is important that we show up authentically. I think for many of us, those of us who are in the minority, like being in predominantly white spaces, we tend to um, want to acclimate, right? Like we tend to want to assimilate instead of bringing our authentic selves. And I think finally now we're sort of moving to the place where it's like, you know, let's make space and place for that to be able to show up and bring our authentic selves. Um, and the other thing is to right, you know, I, I seek to like a gender collaboration across different groups, right? That usually are traditionally not used to working together, particularly as, you know, we sort of move more to a model like working with product, like working with marketing, involving them like in the process of doing and creating this product. And also particularly in the research, I love to very much bring in all my stakeholders and have them be a part and to view the research and the engineers, because if they can't, you know, yes, I can just do a report, and they can hear it, but like actually being there and listening and watching users sort of, you know, either describe like where they're struggling or talk about like motivation just makes a huge difference in the end product design. Um, the other thing that I definitely I, I bring to the table and I think about a lot is it's, it is a unique perspective that I got from my liberal arts education, right? Like there's a lot of stuff, think about like, we learn so much, so many skills, like in these different um, disciplines, right? That like help us to like employ qualitative methods, right? They're valuable for understanding how people behave. We learn how to, you know, to conduct an interview, think about to talking to people, to make that connection, right, in that moment so that, you know, someone feels comfortable sharing with you and that'll help you again to like design a better product. You learn how to synthesize data. That's so much of, of, of what we do is that collecting data, doing that research, right, and within that pulling out what are the patterns, what are the meanings, like this is work that we're already do. This is work that serves you well. Um, in the UX field. The other big thing is the ability to problem solve, right? Like you learn in this, like how to define a problem, right? How to look at it from different perspectives, um, you know, because if you're not starting with the right question, like I said, the answers are not going to have an effective impact. And we don't think about how much of that skill is really important and really comes into play very much like in this field. Um, and the other thing that I know, definitely that I learned, and I think in a lot of liberal, is you learn to advocate, right? Like in this position, like as UX folks, we're learning to advocate for customers, right? Those folks who are not in the room and whose needs may not be taken into consideration, um, but you learn to become a voice for them. And I think that that's one of the things that, again, in the liberal arts education, that we learn about these different communities in different places and spaces and people and we advocate, right? Like we learn to really think about it from their perspective and to, to be a voice in that room. Um, the other thing, you know, I always tell people, right? Like one of the things that's super important for me is like, how do I contribute to improving the experience, right? Like how do I, I, I do that by helping designers and engineers mitigate bias, right? Like I said, I mentioned, you know, workshops at the beginning and we go through exercises that like have the team that force them to confront their biases. And we keep that like, and it's not that we just do it then and then through the rest of the design process, we put it aside. Like we always keep it and come back to it 
continuously as we go through this process, you know, in order to make sure and keep ourselves honest and keep ourselves accountable. Um, I help by, you know, engaging, you know, users with our products, right? Because the idea is at the end of it, like you want someone to have an experience that's going to be enhancing their daily lives rather than disrupting, right? Like you want to create uh, a product that's easy to use and that is human centered and user friendly. And that helps people keep going about their days. And that's one of the things that I've been very intentional about the products that I work on and the companies that I work for, because it's really important to me that, um, you know, everyday folks ha have access to an easy experience, right? Like, I, you know, working at Dell, you know, sort of thinking about the fact that like a, a personal computer and laptop is part of our daily lives, right? Like this is something we all use now um, and it should be, an experience that enhances rather than disrupts, right? So thinking through that, what does that look like? Um, the other thing is helping is like, you know, one of the things, you know, I said in anthropology, we, we learn how to translate. And so, you know, working with cross-functional teams, I often find myself um, in this role where I'm sort of translating between the engineer and the marketing or the product team, right? To help us all sort of get to this place where we're, our common goal is like, how do we serve our customers, right? How are we making sure that we put them at the center of what we're doing? Um, and then the other thing too, that I really thought is like, you know, I, I am so passionate about this idea of equitable and inclusive design um, and talking to folks about it and thinking like, how do we empower all of our users and reminding folks that what we're doing, we're not creating products for people who just look like us, right? We're creating products for a broad swath of individuals who don't just look like us or the leadership team. Um, and this work is, is super important and I've, and I've taken it to, you know, in terms of um, expanding that and thinking about like, how do we do this as well in hiring? That's also become the thing that has become really important to me is thinking about how are we making sure that we're employing um, diverse processes, like in our hiring process that we're thinking about it equitably um, and we're thinking about expanding who's going to be at this table working, doing this work to design and create products. Um, but one of the things that I always sort of <clears throat> talk about and keep in mind is that it is a work in progress, right? Like this is not something that it's going to happen overnight or that we do overnight, right? There's, it's about like investing a lot of time and energy to make sure that you know, that diversity and inclusivity is taken into the design process, right? That we have, um, you know, diverse voices at the table, right? That we're, when we're doing our research, we're starting off with looking and hearing from different communities and different voices in order to then like, you know, keep working and building this equitable world. And that's one of the things like, that's a mission uh, that I'm on and that I hope that you all will join me for. Um, and that's, that's all I have for the PowerPoint. Um, so I would love to then just open it up to, to conversation. I really wanted to be able to hear from you all, to hear more about your experiences. Um, you know, what are some of the things that are, are you finding most challenging? What are the questions that you have? Um, is it okay if we open up for questions and answers now? Does that work? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Norman. The floor is open. Um, you can simply just unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can also just post it in chat. Let me make sure I can see. Is that it? Uh, thank you. This yeah, one question I had. Thank you so very much. This was incredible. And my mind is just spinning. What, as you think about this in a global context, are there elements that aren't as transferable to more homogenous groups? Or do you feel like globally this is broadly applicable? I think, to me, I think globally, I think what we have to think about, right, of course, is language and culture, right, and, and translating it in so many spaces. But I think that what we're seeing, now, like, at least I'm seeing in so many communities, 
um, even globally that have been homogenous, right? So let's take uh, Denmark as an example. Like I've been doing a lot of study and work there with designers there. Like that is more, that is a growing diverse population there, right? Like that, they're, they're not just a homogenous, like everybody's Nordic ancestry, like they're changing. There's a lot of like, you know, there's, there are a lot of, um, um, Muslims who are now becoming very much part of it, who were born there and who mm -hmm. see themselves as Danish, right? You have folks whose parents maybe were born in Africa and who are there. So in a lot of sense, this, I think it is applicable. And I think that a lot of societies are really sort of wrestling with identity and like what we look like and, and who, who is included. And more and more, I think folks are trying to understand like, how, how do we, how do we allow all those voices to be heard and to have a seat at the table because they're they're using the products that that are being created, um, and I'm, I'm and I think more and more I find more and more of those places actually reaching out and looking looking to here to the states, right? Because it's I hate the word to say traditionally, but right been more of a diverse <laughs> society for a longer period of time. So they're sort of you know looking to think about like how do we then. Um, now serve a more diverse population. So I think that's a great question. I think the thing too that's interesting, um, even here in the States thinking about that is uh, some of the research that we've been doing and that I've, I pushed for, particularly when I was um, working in Texas was making sure that the research we were doing, I was like, we need to be translating this in Spanish because this, there's a large Hispanic population here and we are missing out <laughs> on that feedback and they're using this, you know, it was at the time we were creating um, an online grocery e-commerce platform. And I was like, we're missing the boat here. Like if we, and we're excluding all of these individuals who would be using this. So like really pushing folks to think about that and not just think about, you know, cause then it was like, okay, find somebody who speaks Spanish. I was like, not only just that they speak Spanish but that they have some cultural understanding as well. Right? Like that has to be a part of it as well. Um, I see Alex, is that the next hand? Oh, oh yeah, thank you. Um, it was just amazing and mind blowing. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any like uh, lists of best practices or checklist or something um, simple that we can give to our students or practitioners as like a starting point um, for, for like a things to look for, um, for, universal design, accessible design, but specifically the type of stuff you're talking about? Um, so one of the things that I, I do say, and I, I, I'll i sort of put that up, but one of the first days, like the sort of our process that we do, right? Like having the design team think about their bias, right? And be able to have a conversation and confront that, have them go through the exercise of thinking about who, what, who, do, who, who do you think it will be the user for this product? And then force them to think about, okay, who do you think, like I said, could be potentially harmed by using this product, right? That person that you're not sort of thinking about. Um, so those are those are definitely some of the, the exercises, right? To, to sort of go through beforehand before we even start doing the research. Um, and, then, and then again, in thinking in very practically and intentionally about who you're recruiting, right? So like, like I said, thinking through, even like when we were thinking about this e-commerce platform, initially the team, no one even thought about like, do we translate this into Spanish, right? Like, do we, who are we thinking about, right? So again, being very aware of that and making sure that you're intentional about the level of diversity and then finding the ways in which you can now sort of go out and recruit um, more, a more diverse population as well. So I think those are definitely some of, some of the ways. Um, and I will share this presentation because definitely some of the resources, I think like the IAT test, having people do that, right. Having folks like <laughs> take a little look in the cognitive bias and the frameworks like that, I, it will be super helpful and useful for the students. I see that um, uh, we have a question uh, in chat. What is your favorite thing about user research? Honestly, talking to people. I think, again, that's where like I end up with it. I love um, talking to people and sort of understanding their experiences and, and how they're approaching and, and figuring out like, how, how do I meet your need, right? Like, you know, I always tell people like, we, we should be, whatever we end up creating should be um, 
should be fulfilling a function and a need. Like this, it shouldn't just be something we think up and we think is, is cool. Um, so IDIs, like intentional like um, interviews, that's literally one of my favorite thing to get on a call with someone and talk to them, you know, about sort of, you know, like even with this credit building product, like how do you, how do you approach credit? How do you think about it? Do you even think about it, right? Like my, you know, we, we were starting, we had to check ourselves with the assumption that of course, like everybody wants it, but like, do you even think about it? You know, like, how do you think about it? How do you check? Like, so really sort of going through that and, and, and from that, like, you know, getting an understanding of what people need and then distilling that to come up with something that would be most useful for them. Um, the other thing I, I, I love is sort of um, being able to take the research that we've done and take it back to our stakeholders, right? Like, I, it, and I, I love showing them video so that they can see, right? Like how people are talking about the, this product or this idea, um, how they're using it and kind of some of the problems. One of the thing that was honest, the most impactful thing was when I was doing a project for Dell, um, we had this, um, this young doctor who like her, her Dell laptop was like how she kept track of everything at her clinic, how she got her work done. And that laptop just stopped working in the middle of one of her consultations. Um, and, you know, we were lucky enough to be there like in person and, we've been, you know, recording her day so they can see a day in life. And when the executives got to see like how much this disrupted, not only her, but like her patients, right? These are people, you know, who needed her help and whose records she couldn't access. It totally, they were just blown away because they hadn't had any sort of touch point with that, so, right? So making that touch point and reminding them that there is a human at the center of this problem, this issue, um, is one of the things that I, I love about um, UX. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Um, Sky, do you have a question? Um, yeah, hi. Um, so my question is, um, as a woman heading into tech, um, just kind of starting out, um, how would you suggest that um, I kind of, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, but to um, include diversity and inclusivity um, when you are kind of a small fish in a big pond, like when you're just starting out, um, and, and coming from a place of privilege as a white woman, how can I speak up for diversity and in inclusivity? Um, so are you talking about just when you're in, like just starting out, like in, yeah, you know, a person you know, like just, at a tech company? Yeah. I think like you have, use your voice, right? Like you have that from that privilege and that position, you almost to me, like when you are like, it's use your voice, right? And let people know that this is important to you um, and speak up like it's hard but like that is that's literally the only way like for me I was brand new um, at Gusto and one of the first things I did was I you know I brought up cognitive bias in a, in a design meeting um, and you know it was it was a little I won't lie it was a little scary because I was like I don't know how they're gonna like react to this right but um, what I'm finding is that people are hungry for it Right. And I think that it shows a lot of initiative on your part and that this is something it's so important now, like we can't not talk about it. Um, so I think that one of the ways is and, and I would do it, one of the things that I did was, you know, I sort of brought in I was like, you know, hey, this is like, you know, David Dylan Thomas and like this is sort of, you know, just a snippet of what he was talking about. Um, and also to thinking examples. Right. Like one of the things that was used to think about like is the product like you know maybe the product that you're working on maybe there's an example from that where you can show um that there's bias in the product and that can that can be a way in right because then you're you're like showing that you've taken some initiative to look at it from this different lens and now sort of taking it back and being like hey this is another way of looking at this product and in this way and when i did it i sort of found you know x y and z does that does that make sense does that help it does a lot. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Sky. Thank you for the question. All right, let's get to a question by Susan Perry. Have you found CEOs and other top executives resistant to these ideas? And if so, what have you found to be most effective in winning them over? Um, presenting facts. 
honestly, yeah, there, there has been, was there, there's going to be, right? Because people think, um, so one of the things I did do was to take that lens and looking at one of the product features at Gusto, right? One of the features that we were putting out was going to be a background check. And nobody had thought of, because the customers were asking for it, they're like, oh, well, of course we'll provide it. But they hadn't thought about the ramifications for communities of color right? Applying for jobs to this. So um, one of the things I did was to sort of to show like went through like a, a, um, a demo to show the, the, the potential effect of that. And that got their attention. And then also too, then I showed them some of the facts. I was like, well, and I and I, you know, it was bold. And I, so, but I looked at the design team. I said, who was on this design team for creating <laughs> this product feature? And when we looked at it, they were all predominantly white, right? Predominantly well-to-do and folks who never had a record and didn't have family members or know anyone who had that. So it, it just, it had never occurred to them, right? So that was one of the ways and they stopped and took a pause and were like, oh, well, we hadn't thought about that, right? And, and so then it was then sort of showing them this sort of like, okay, that kind of got them to really like shift and, and then start to actually um, want to do a look, like to, to take a look at all of the major project features through a diversity and inclusion lens. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Shelbo. Um, Shelbo, would you like to just kind of just talk? Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, I said, Dr. Norman, I really admire your industry experience. And as a junior faculty uh, with limited industry experience <laughs> or connections, I really want to um, you know, make my research kind of relevant or to be able to impact industry practice, but often I find it very hard to do so. Um, so what are some of the, where are some of the platforms or what are they mm. and um, uh, where are all the organizations and what are the ways to impact UX research and or, or practicing industry except to going to conferences like STC. Um, and we do have some working professionals as our um, students in our MA program. So that has helped us build somewhat, you know, kind of connections or bridge the gaps. Uh, but um, I think I'm still struggling <laughs> making the connections. Thank you. So you know, you're welcome. So that, that's a great question. And I'm, I one slide I think I left off. So I want to talk about is networking and organizations, right? So I think that UXPA, right? User Experience Professional Association, that's a great way. Um, there's a number of, you know, there's a new um, organization called UX Research and Strategy, where it's actually like this great partnership between, um, you know, professionals, as well as like academics who are doing some of this work. And that's been really super successful. Um, there's another organization that I'm, uh, it's called Quali Qualitative and Quantitative Research. I'll get the exact title and, and share that as well. But that's another space in which um, you're starting to see this like academia and, and like, you know, industry professionals starting to talk and have conversations like across that, because that is a big problem as well. I 100% I agree and I, I support it. One of the things that I really pushed Gusto to do, and I made them meet with um, academics who had done work on background check, right? And, I, and one, one of the things that I did that I spoke about and I asked the academic, I was like, I'm gonna ask you now to like, remember that you're talking to non-academics because that's the other thing too, that is really critical to think about is the language that we use, right? The language that we use in academia is very different than what like, you know, corporate language is. Like corporate language needs to be like very short and right. like straight to the point, you know, without, you know, a lot of like, you know, complexity and like, you know, bullet, straight bullet points. Um, and that's something, and, and, and that's a barrier oftentimes that I, I, that I tell people to think about, right? Think about what kind of language that you're using to explain, like as an academic to somebody in industry, the point you're trying to make, because I think it's really important because there's so much great work that's done in academia that talks about the diversity, that talks about inequity and the bias that unfortunately doesn't get translated. Um, into industry very often, unless you have someone working in industry who has an academic background. Um, wow. But there are a number of organizations that are really trying to push to do that. And I will be happy to, to share that because I think that it's, we need it. We need more of that collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We have some great questions. Michelle asked, 
UX research with the pandemic, how has it been to conduct this and to have that diversity and be unbiased remote versus in person? It's been it's been a challenge, right? Um, that's one of the things, right? So I, prior, right, to the pandemic, one of the things that helped to mitigate that bias was the fact that we we could go to folks, we could go to people and see them, you know, like in their context, in their environment, have them come in to meet us and to be able to, you know, establish that rapport in person, right? Because if we're, you know, especially we were asking them things about like grocery buying or like, you know, we were doing sort of medical research, like very, these are very intimate personal things. Um, so what we had to do was sort of to figure out like, you know, icebreakers that we could do on Zoom to sort of start to, you know, make that, make that connection. Um, literally think about even, um, I remember one of the things that I thought about was even like, what are you wearing that day? Like, remember we had to talk to um, a lot of uh, truck drivers that we were, there was a system that we were helping to get. And I was like, you know, if I, if I like show up in like, you know, wearing certain things, they're going to feel sort of uncomfortable. So I have to think about like, you know, where, what am I wearing? Like on the screen, the other thing to think about um, that we ended up having to do for certain communities um, we actually provided devices because there were some folks, it was a community of folks that we wanted to do research with that just didn't have access to, um, you know, a personal computer to do a Zoom. And so we sent it, we, we mailed <laughs> devices in, in ways like we, we had to sort of get very uh, creative. Um, one of the things that I started using more were diary studies. I hadn't used a diary studies as much in the past. And I began doing that because that allowed folks to, do the research on their own time, right? And within the scope of like their daily lives, like when they had it. And so it wasn't tied to them like having to get on a Zoom with me at a certain time. Um, and that provided a lot, and they could do that on their phone, right? Like figuring out how do we make it easy and like switching to more mobile um, access things, right? Because most people, we, you know, like had a phone at least could do that. So that was one of the ways that we had to, um, to really pivot, um, but, I think now we all live in this world, we're kind of used to Zoom. <laughs> um, so I will actually say that that's, that that's made it a little easier. People aren't as taken aback. Um, I mean, I, I've been using Zoom even before like to do research because you know when we were in Austin, we wanted to work doing a project for Dell, we wanted national representation. Um, so we actually sort of you know started to use Zoom and sort of I figured out you know ways through that of, you know, sort of making folks feel comfortable and letting people be like, you know, like, because you're letting me into your home and your life, right? Particularly with that, because we had to have them take videos of their kitchen or of their, you know, um, so finding ways to make it fun for them and like more like adventure, like, oh, okay, so now where are you going to show me your kitchen? What do you have in there? Like, oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, you know, I like that too. I tend to cook this. Like, and so it's, it's been really um, interesting, like having to stretch and learn, right? Like new ways of creating connectivity um, remotely. Um, I see the hand up from uh, my colleague, Alicia. Uh, oh my goodness, Dr. Lizane, I could talk to you about this for 37,000 hours. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for this. And thank you, thank you, Schwinn, for putting this on. What a great series. I have a bunch of questions, but I think I'm going to focus on one that's going to steer the conversation a little bit because um, one of my areas of research, I do intercultural communication. So all of the things you're talking about, this is what my classroom is all of the time. So um, I really resonated with that and, and um, be happy to share resources of how we do that back and forth and that sort of thing. But anyways, my other area is environmental communication. Mm. So thinking about how do we define nature? How is that cultural? What is our orientation to the environment? What are our biases that come into play when we're thinking about the environment? Where do those come from? Oftentimes it's our lived experience, our historical experience, our media experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, you, you had an earlier slide that said, you know, thinking about who is at the table. I'm wondering if you have given thought and if the people you've worked with have given thought to what? is at the table. Mm -hmm. When you say what is at the table, that that's interesting. So I'm thinking about, you know, what are we making our products out of? Yeah. Um, are we looking to the animal kingdom to get really creative solutions? I was thinking about the, um, the car, the self-driving car situation. 
One of the things we know from cephalopods, the octopus families, is how unbelievable they are at responding to color variation. So I'm wondering, how, is the design team thinking about from inception to end put our orientation and thoughts about the environment? Do you think that comes into play in design? Is that something far down the line? And then what can we learn from the environment to help our designs be even more diverse and inclusive than we could even have thought through? So I love that. So yes, so there, there is, and I will say I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be at a company that's starting to think about that. I don't think that that's the norm. I don't think enough people are thinking about the larger impact of like, right, what we're designing. Like, are we using plastic? Why, why are we using, do we need to use plastic? Like, I, I, I don't think there's enough questioning about that. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, God, I, I love it. That's just a wonderful question. And I think that some, you're starting to see some companies think about that. Um, one of the things that you meant is like, so I did at the, there's a large sort of environmental group at, at Gusto. Um, and one of the things that we were doing and that we actually, that you mentioned as a design team to do was to read um, a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, um, which yes, is by much. this, right? This amazing book by this Native American author who thinks about, let's think about the different ways in which other people relate to the environment. Like yeah. let's, yeah. let's think through differently, like how we approach nature, what we think of the, what nature is possible of. And one of the things that I, I, I'm really trying to do, and I, in some other talks that I've, I've presented um, to the design team is talking to them about, these are the different ways in which other cultures think about design, right? Like thinking about it from like an, an, an African perspective. Like one of the things I studied was African religion and thinking about design and functionality. Like things aren't, it has, everything has a function, right? Like everything to design has a function. Um, thinking about it from an Aboriginal or um, perspective is, everything and really ties what you're talking about, everything serves the community and, and nature is a part of that community, mm -hmm. right? So approaching even the effort design. And I think that I, I'm hoping that more, does, like the, the thing is that too, what's interesting that we're talking about this now is that I hope that, you know, that you all are offering some kind of course on that because what I'm finding in a lot of times is like, that's kind of where it starts. It starts right where at, at this educational level, like, what are you talking about in the classrooms, right? Like, what are, what are the, are the students starting to think differently about that? Then those will be, that will be something that they will bring with them when they come into industry, right? And they're in there, they'll be that person, that voice at the table to be like, okay, wait, what are we designing? Wait, is this good for it? Like long-term, what is the effect that this is going to have on our environment? And then us as members of this, like our bodies, like, you know, going to the future. So I, I, a lot of the times I think that so much of it starts there because one of the other things that I noticed that when I look at sort of like um, design um, syllabi is that like, there's, there's not enough, now there's more, but there are really, people need to talk about ethics. Like, what is it like, what are we designing? Should we be designing this? Like, should we be creating this? I wish somebody had had that conversation with Mark Zuckerberg, I hate to say it, but this is that, you know, like, is this, you know, like, let's think about the long-term effects and consequences of what we're creating. And so I went on in my little, but thank you so much for like bringing that into the conversation. Eu falo português também. Ah, que legal. Another question from Skype. Skype. I didn't have one. I'm sorry. It just oh. didn't take off my little hand. <laughs> All right. Well, um, any other questions? We still have a few minutes. Well, hearing none, um, we are at time. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lisa, uh, Lisa Norman for a wonderful presentation and an in-depth discussion with our participants. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight. 
Um, this event is being video recorded and um, the recording will be available um, uh, to the general public. And uh, in case you're curious about our uh, programs here, I have posted our Twitter and our program website in chat. Uh, you're welcome to follow us on Twitter. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. This has been great. Thank you so much man, for inviting me to come and talk to the students. Please be in touch. Like, um, you know, he has my email. Please reach out to me if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn. And let's let's continue this discussion. And like, you know, kudos to all of you for coming tonight and for continuing to do this great work. Thank you Muchas so much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Norman. De nada. <laughs> All right, good night. Ciao, buon noche. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Thank you, Dr. Welcome, Norman. Thank you.